let me know when the stream comes up online howdy folks welcome to another painting session I'm Dan joined again by Matty morning Matty uh, morning Dan um, technical difficulties as in I've changed laptops and the settings aren't the same because I've set it up again so we were just debating about whether the main picture was right or wrong and we've decided that it doesn't really matter um, we we're also debating about whether the inset picture is right or wrong and in my opinion it's wrong but I don't know how to correct it so we'll just move on um, and because we've been debating all of this I'm completely unprepared but there's nothing unusual in that um, I might turn that virtual camera off just to save some processor load yeah good idea um, any idea what I did last week? Uh, any, any idea who I was last week? <laughs> Didn't you do spaceships? Last week? No, that was week before. What did I do last oh, week? Oh, heck. No, oh, it was uh, Noble Bowman. Oh, yeah. I'll go and get those. Hang on. Dan's empty chair brought to you by uh, unpreparedness for whenever you need it. What do I mean? Uh, oh, I'm just trying to tell a uh, filler joke. <laughs> I'm sure it'll go over a smash hit with the audience. Absolutely. Good afternoon, Ross. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Maddie. So, this is how the Bowman turned out. Um, I'm pretty pleased with them. The uh, the shield decals are excellent, and we should definitely do something about producing them again. <laughs> Ross chuckles quietly to himself. And knowing that I've already put that pressure on and I'm not getting very far. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a topic for conversation uh, later this afternoon when we uh, figure out how to uh, inform the world of all of your work that you've been doing for Demon World. My, my Demon World endeavours. Yes. I was thinking about that. Um, not wanting to preempt that discussion or anything, but uh, maybe writing an article about w why I'm doing what I'm doing. Well, you have a a outlet for blog posts on the uh, mm -hmm. on the website, and I think the current entry is <laughs> multiple years old at this point. Oh uh, yeah, um, I've got a test site that I've been playing with. So maybe I need to talk to Brad about sorting the current new one in or something or yes. Absolutely. Yes. Refreshing it. Yeah. <clears throat> um. So today I'm going to do the beginnings of some uh, Wood Elf Spearmen. And the reason for that is because we want to start playtesting, and I've discovered that I don't have enough basic troops for my wood elves. So, um, I'll put some goggles on, we'll get painting, and we can continue the conversation. Yeah. 
Yes, Todd notes that he might be able to join us in 45 minutes or so. Right, eh? That'd be good. Any update on your uh, tradey, Matty? Uh, none, aside from the fact it's been raining all morning. Right. I'm so disorganised that my wet palette is... Time for a change. So stop raining there, Russ. Um, no. And uh, when last we spoke, or uh, I don't remember if we mentioned it. We, one of our major expressways here, uh, you know, a four-lane M road, mm. uh, was closed yesterday due to a mudslide oh um and turns out i-5 this is the main north-south expressway between canada and mexico going through seattle portland yep major cities in in uh, california um in washington uh i think it's a 20 or 30 mile stretch has actually flooded so it's closed and uh the prospects for opening are maybe well into next week so that's a pretty big deal because of the snow all the mountain passes in Washington are closed uh, this was the way in from the south so there's basically no easy way to get to Seattle from anywhere right now by car by wheels so good clean fun as they say <laughs> <laughs> Except for the guys that are cleaning up the mudslide. I don't think that's well, going to be clean fun. <laughs> yeah, well, that was easy. I mean, that's just a matter of moving dirt. But yeah. uh, uh, some of the pictures of the uh, flooding uh, are quite spectacular at the moment. So, um. and nothing to do there but wait for the water to recede. Mm -hmm. Buy a boat. Um, well, I don't know. The, that that business would be, uh, you know, unloading uh, forty foot containers and hauling them twenty, you know, twenty miles by a uh, by boat and then loading them up again. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't be very lucrative, I don't think. Um, it's interesting. Large ferries. Yeah, uh, we had an inland uh, city flood two or three days ago with um, storms. Really? Yeah. What was this? Ballarat. Oh, okay. It's State. Victoria. Who cares? Yeah, yeah. exactly right. But the um, uh, day before yesterday, they had... I, I don't know what the actual figures are, but looking at the, the rain radar, expecting the rain to come down and hit us, it just sat over Ballarat for four hours. Um, I don't know. Did, Ross, do you have the, the sort of the meteorological websites with the rain radars and that sort of stuff oh yeah. oh yeah 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 um do they have the color coding sort of of the oh, yeah. white blue white, through purple blue yeah right so this these were dark reds and blacks sitting over this city <laughs> for about four hours uh i guess Jehalis, uh i mean they're talking I don't think they've hit double digit inches over the last 24 hours, but it's close. Yeah, so this is the difference between And it's and it's warm rain and it's wa it's melting snow on the mountains and yeah, it's all flowing down. Yeah, and so it's Let's see if I can find a good picture here. So we don't have the snow to contend with because it's completely the wrong time of year. But um yeah, I notice you're wearing, uh, showing off your short sleeve shirts there instead of the. Uh... Oh, it's just disgusting here at the moment. It's. What does my little doovie say? Just on 20 degrees Celsius, 65% humidity. It's just sticky. And I happen to have my Desert Rats t shirt on, which is probably fortuitous. I think I might have had the Africa call one on yesterday. Uh, let's see. If 
makes feeling better here. It's twenty four ninety. Ninety percent. And uh an hour earlier in the day. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, you can keep it. I really don't like it. We've had um, stupendous heat and humidity over the last week. Like, I'm surprised not everything is completely mouldy. It's all those tennis players that you guys <laughs> import this time of year. <laughs> Every year, the Australian Open, 40 degree heat. The worst weather in the world. Uh, you know? I think. I think. Every I... year. I think our ability to import them is now impaired. Probably well, also, ir- yes. Irrevocably. Uh, yes, we're all wa- eagerly waiting to see how long uh, world number one lasts in country before he's before his situation is resolved, shall we say. <laughs> I'm eagerly awaiting uh, Australia's bid to take down Serbia. And through the abuse of it, its number one tennis star, um, <coughs> the theories that people come up with for why things are done is beyond belief. Are you pretending that it was anything other than utter malice? I'm pretending it was nothing other than utter stupidity. Oh, I contend that it was malice at the part of the entry customs officer possibly but stupid just just poor very stupid poor poor very stupid poorly handled in the extreme it's like the guy should never have got on the plane in the first place well my understanding is that the uh victoria folks gave him an gave him an exception and then started asking, are we allowed to do that? Are we the ones to make the rules? And then the, the next bracket up, the, the national government said, no, we're not going to let them in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, there was a, a bunch of people that saw a paycheck and there was a bunch of people that, that saw the political fallout and went, we don't care about your paycheck. So, yeah, that should have been long resolved before he even got on the plane. It's just embarrassing all around. Good morning. Good afternoon. James! Some headset problems. Yeah, that's going around. Oh, this would be a good picture if I could get a still. I can't. Oh, mm. well. How are things down south, James? Well, in the middle. Probably better than Ross is experiencing at the moment, I I suspect. Less water? Well, the worst of it is probably 20, 30 miles north of us. but uh... Uh, Further up the coast? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know quite what's going on on the west coast. It seems... (laughs) Yeah, I... There are no words. <laughs> we just had our first snow, <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> Point six inches. Behold the horror. <laughs> Point six of an inch. Um, I think the base at the ski resort in Mount Hood, which is you know within sight of our place, the base is I think over one hundred and twenty inches now. So. so warm rain on that could be really quite catastrophic, couldn't it? Uh, yeah, that, and that has happened. It happens regularly, you know, once or twice every decade or so, and mm. it, uh, it creates spectacular flooding, yes. But we aren't there yet at the moment. Right. It's still dumping snow in the mountains. So all that will um, will defrost though, right? And will will that help with the uh, um, the ongoing drought situation, or is it just pretty much a case of things run off? No, it helps. Um, you know, the, there's one theory 
that you know the the mountain and the the, the mountain the mountain range the Cascades act as a giant sponge, and uh, when it snows and melts slowly, it all seeps in and does exactly what it's supposed to do, and will help dramatically with the drought. Um, and if this can happen, you know, all the way down into California, that would be great. But it takes, uh, you know, multiple years of this kind of stuff to catch up. Um, and that's the problem, I guess. The news feed I read this morning says, you know, it's been 20 years since California has had regular, or what used to be considered regular, uh, precipitation across the state. Um and into the Rocky dry. Mountains. Yeah. Yeah, all those, all those aquifers are basically just getting sucked dry. Yep. Um, I think, I don't know if, who I mentioned it to, but uh, certain water districts in California have been told they're basically getting zero water from river sources in the, in the coming year because of that kind of problem. Yeah, I remember reading something about that on uh, one of the homesteading channels. Someone was was discussing that, but yeah, just pretty grim if you're if you're reliant on it, absolutely reliant on it. So, are they going to build a desalination plant? <laughs> um, I to. think there's too many people. <laughs> The end of that joke was build a desalination plant and leave it sit idle for 10 years because you don't need it. Because that's what they did here. But it's ready if you do need it, right? Yep. Except they won't have used it and so <laughs> they'll turn it on and it'll break because they haven't used it. Well, that's like here. They, uh, uh, they built a, a jail um, and there was a bond to pay for it. So it's brand spanking new jail, perfect. Uh, and then it was never open because there were no operating funds for it. <laughs> and it hung around for a while. It was used as movie sets and uh, TV sets and then was finally sold off. And I think, I think it's on its way to being used as a uh, place to house homeless. Right. Well, that's not ominous. <laughs> no. Well, you know, one of the issues is if you can concentrate them and then provide the services to attempt to get them out of their predicament, um, maybe you'll have some success. So, Well, I have a question for you. You got familiarity with Star Trek, of course. How are some. you with uh, Deep Space Nine? Um, not, as, not as much. All right, well, there was a two-part episode called uh, Past Tense which basically described exactly what you were doing it, um, in Oakland of in, I guess, Oakland in San Francisco, although they won't admit it. Uh, they blocked off a 10-city a block area, built walls and filled it with homeless people to concentrate the service delivery and all that and it ended up being a prison. Well, the the the, the walls the part. Twenty twenty four. The walls part was a. Uh, uh, you know, it's it's a great argument about uh, free will, and yes, you do have the freedom to do just about anything you want. Uh, and then the corollary goes: as long as it doesn't affect other people, and that's where we're in the catch twenty two. You can have any color you like, as long as it's black. Yep. Mm. This wouldn't happen to be run by the Soylent Company and be <laughs> facility green or something? Uh, those comparisons and jokes have been uh, made, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. probably... Aren't we in the Soylent Green year now? We Was are. It, wasn't it 2022? 2022. Yeah. 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 That's why it's so f front of mind. So what year was Silent Running? Basically, 
Earth is pretty much done, and, and they just send out the, that massive ship with the with the, the big greenhouse domes on it. I'm not sure if you've ever seen that one. I mm, don't remember. It's like a last last the last habitat of um, you know wildlife and plant life and stuff on on planet Earth, and to preserve it, they build this this not a colony ship, but it's, it's like a massive park, but it's it's a series of um, hemispheres attached to the to the main ship um mm. that's kind of the the main the main spaceship in the movie but yeah there's there's a little more to it than that I just imagine the ending of that where it gets hit by a rock Has anybody in the chat at the moment read the Gulag Archipelago? I've read it, but I don't claim to recall it. Right. Just thinking that you concentrate people in a in an area and um, give them finite resources, the behaviour tends to be a race towards the bottom. Is that Solzhenitsyn? Solzhenitsyn, Solzhenitsyn, yeah. Solzhenitsyn, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I vaguely recall reading something along those lines in, in school, but, you know, we're going back decades. Yeah, well, okay, so it was released in the early 70s, and it was basically, you know, I think it was written from the perspective of his time in the Gulag, because he was a political yeah, better be person up. for a decade or so. So, yeah. um, people don't behave very well when you put them in large groups and then constrain resources. There's a game in that called Human Occupied Landfill. It's a, I was going to say a classic RPG. It's the whole game is entirely um, handwritten drawn right. yeah in fact i believe that, that the designers originally designed it on napkins while they were eating at restaurants and then kind of transferred it from there okay but the premise is effectively a prison planet of, of sorts where they just dump all the filth and detritus of humanity and then just let them work out their differences isn't that both america and australia yep oh definitely australia <laughs> <laughs> Speaking is this of the part where we go into prison colonies or not? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Speaking of classic RPGs, I seem to have lost my copy of Macho Women with Guns. Take it you guys have never seen you... that one? Sure have. Yep. Mm hmm. I had all the supplements too. And they're gone. Gone, gone. Did the puppy eat them? No. I've moved 23 or 24 times, James. It, it'll, they'll have been lost in one of those there. moves somewhere. <laughs> Cross states. I haven't moved countries yet. That is definitely a thing. <laughs> Not recommended yeah. if you have a large role-playing gaming connection, just quietly. <laughs> <laughs> Emotionally and, <laughs> and everything else that goes with it, financially. The, 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 the person in this discussion that I think would do it hardest would be Ross. What? Who? You moving house. Uh, I managed to stay in one place for 35 years, accumulated vast amounts of stuff, mm -hmm. and, and then moved. And as we all know, vast amounts of stuff are still in their moving boxes. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have to abandon any like I think James had to. Right. How many trucks? Um... 
funny story. I, it was just one, <laughs> but <laughs> when they weighed it, the truck, they said, they said, shit, we're way over. Therefore, we cannot go on the interstates because we can't go to the way stations because mm-hmm. we'll get fined and impounded. Right. So they had to go back roads. Um, and uh, the moving company lost their shirt because the guy who estimated it didn't really realize how much paper product I had. Right. And that stuff is heavy in a small area. <laughs> yep. Yep. Well, you're transporting logs of wood effectively. Um, I, you know, paper might actually be uh, denser than uh, natural wood. Mm. So, especially when it's book form. <laughs> we picked up those, um, you know, the 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 last back catalog items from um, Mongo's that time from Dayton their warehouse mm-hmm. up in Ohio and 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 that that didn't fill a small garage it was it was only probably maybe a third third full and that was over a ton <laughs> of books yeah. no a, a, a four foot by four foot by four foot pallet of books is uh, um, you know that's a thousand pounds yep that's forklift territory yep Oh, it's big forklift territory. There's no, well, one, of those, jack, one of those pallet jack. Pallet, yeah. Oh, pallet jack, yep. yeah. Yeah, those things are pretty cool. They, they do the job well. <laughs> Especially if you have two of them and they're electric. You know what that means? Races. Exactly. <laughs> Plus, they pay for themselves when you... Uh, when you're at conventions and you've got your own gear and nobody else has or there are companies that, that don't and you can rent it out. Not that that happens because Gen Con has its own union for one for a better word. But Electric pallet jack races. And it's because you're, uh, you stand on the forks mm-hmm. and you steer um, it is really easy to, uh, you know, if you go beyond 45 degrees with the wheels, uh, odds are they're going to go immediately to 90 and <laughs> you know, crash to a stop. <laughs> so there is some skill involved. Uh-huh. You didn't put that mod into Red Planet, though, did you? Uh, we were beyond pallet jacks for Red Planet. Mm. Plus, there's plenty of things to crash into in Red Planet. <laughs> you know, other uh, vehicles included. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so what about collision rules? It's been brought up a number of times. For? Intercept. Uh, that means we might have to actually think about how big a hex is, and that's a, a place we don't really want to go, right? Mm, yeah. I leave that one in Todd's too hard basket. I don't want it in mine. Well, what are the odds of an accidental collision? Um, Even in a you know, reasonable chunk of space. Uh, look at ships. Look at planes. Look at you name it. They 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 run into each other. It just seems to happen. Like magnets. Yeah. I was thinking as opposed to intentional collisions, of course. It's like, I'm going down and I'm taking you with me type type stuff. But What, our, our overriding philosophy is the equipment is cheap, but the pilots are not? Yep. So, you want to, tr- you want to live to fight another day. Mm-hmm. And I, I think all of us agreed upon the rule that uh, an interceptor, if you fire on a pilot who's ejected, from that point on, whenever you play the game, your target number just went up by one for everything. <laughs> I don't know we yeah. agreed on that rule, but, but I think it should be a thing. 
the bad form, dear chap. Bad yep. form rule. Yes, the machine gunning parachutists rule. Uh, I don't know, ransom them. Ransom them. Ransom them. Uh, I can't say it. Ransom. Ransoming. Ransoming them. Yeah. That's a different story, I think. Capturing and ransoming. That should be a thing, absolutely. We'll have to mention that to Todd. Prisoner creating exchange. the list while he's not here. <laughs> Prisoner exchange. That's got to go into the campaign rules. It's going on the notepad. There you go. So is this different when it comes to things like Leviathans, where the, the crew are technically expendable because we can just get a bunch of plebs and pretty much train them to the minimum level? I don't know. Whereas, you know, pilots, officers, etc., massive investment in time. I, I think the the investment in crew training should be the same. I think the Leviathans, I don't know. What do you think, Ross? Do you think if we've got the technology to produce fighters at a ridiculous rate, we should also be able to produce Leviathans at a ridiculous rate? It, it all goes back to the to the uh, epiphany I had when yeah. back in the Battletech Battle days. Yeah. Um, how far? How often do battles occur? What are the normal equipment casualties in any given battle? That means they have to be able to make them pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, everybody would just run out. How many carriers did the U.S. lose in '42? Those people that don't have paintbrushes in their hands and ready access to Google. I'm interested was in. It was it only a handful. I was interested in the loss rates, 42, 43, and 44. Um, well, the loss rates may have stayed the same, but by 44 and 45, there were the hundreds, product. if you count the, uh, the, escort um, the small ones. Yeah. 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 No, the... Uh, uh, my neck of the woods here in Portland uh, was one of the construction locations for ships for shipping and I mean Liberty ships were being squirted out I think they did it just to prove that they could do it like one a day 48 hours they, they literally built one in 48 hours to prove that they could the, the usual rate of construction was a week wasn't it mm -hmm. yeah so if it looks like um, one, two, three, four, five aircraft carriers, US aircraft carriers in World War Two, Hornet, Lexington, Princeton, Wasp of the Yorktown, and then a bunch of escort aircraft carriers. Um, those were the seven losses. of those. Yeah, yeah, a couple of battleships, some oh, heavy okay. cruisers. The battleships were done at Pearl, weren't they? Yeah, were they? They? I don't think they were. Combat battleship losses were there. Um, Arizona sunk by carrier-based aircraft bombs, Pearl Harbor, and yeah. the Oklahoma and Pearl Harbor as well. Yeah, yeah, so they were both Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Whereas the Japanese lost quite a number in combat situations. The Utah is not listed as a battleship, as it, as it had been converted to an anti-aircraft gunnery training ship by the time of her sinking. Yeah. So it goes into a different category at the time. <laughs> Number one. And of course, yeah, the Yorktown and Battle of Midway, that was the one I was thinking of. But the, the others, Battle of Santa Cruz, Battle of the Coral Sea, uh, Late Gulf, and just happened to be out in the ocean and taken out by a Japanese submarine. So that was the Wasp. Mm -hmm. Heavy cruisers, the Indianapolis, of course, very famous for other reasons. Yeah, well. Jamais Australia. Tropical waters and big eaty fish. And it's the cargo it had just delivered. Mm. That as well, yes. Um, so the point was, how many did they build? 42, 43, 44. Please hold. Please yes, hold. we'll give James a moment to research that. <laughs>
but if we but we're talking about an industrial base that is going to be several magnitudes larger yeah oh yeah absolutely I got in trouble years gone by when I suggested that you know we could um, extrapolate from wartime production figures from the Second World War to a science fiction setting. So. I don't know. We have, I guess, the 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 holdup with the capital ships with the Leviathans is just uh, assembly of all of the pieces that the fabricators have squirted out, right? Yeah, but you know, if you've got plus the one or two things that can't be fabricated, the main gun and the you know the spinal mount, and who knows what else we'll come up with. You would have to build the spinal mount in place, wouldn't you? Like, assemble it in place? like, Or, or start with it, yeah. Mm. Or the, the framework that holds it, at least. Mm -hmm. So, the year we started World War II with seven aircraft carriers and built roughly 160 more. <laughs> how many but of in those specific were, years. How many of those were fleet carriers and how many were escort carriers? Escort, um, car escort carriers, 1943, 19, 31 in 44, and 1945. 24 50. fleet carriers in, in total out of that. 24 fleet carriers in three years. Nine light carriers um, and roughly 125 escort carriers. So, from that, Ross, I think we can just pick a figure, honestly, and justify it any way we like. Well, part of the campaign rules will be the, uh, you know, we've talked around it many mm. times, just how many of them can there be, yep. and when does running away become the correct thing to do instead of battling it out to the, uh, to the bitter end? Mm -hmm. But we don't want to be like Noble Armada where each capital ship is a you know a national heirloom no yeah simply because they're almost impossible to build so mm -hmm. therefore capture is always the intent almost always yeah I don't like that at all I want to see them go bang But again, it's a case of, you know, in any war, you're, you're committing material. You need to be able to supply and maintain that if you're mm -hmm. going to commit to a protracted um, campaign. Conflict. Yes. Yeah. Conflict. Thank you. And then, yeah, then it's a question, of, as you said, of, you know, if, if the cost of material that's being committed into the conflict is greater than your ability to, to supply it and maintain it, you've got some problems. <laughs> Napoleon, Hitler, we're looking at you. Well, you know. You know, the Soviets had the same same problem World War Two. You know, they were they did, didn't have the resources to basically build. Um, wasn't until you know that they did the deal with America, sent them all the all the necessary stuff to build lots and lots and lots and lots of tanks um, and other things that things turned around for them. The Soviets have the luxury of trading space for time. Yeah, that's a that's a generalisation, of course. But of course, you it know. is. They also uh, the the genius move was moving the factories. That was the genius move. Oh, totally. Yeah, move them move them well out of the way. There's no way that they're going to get taken out. Yeah. No matter how many times we tried when playing war in Europe. Couldn't quite simulate that, or <laughs> well, it's it's uh, at a certain point in the game, uh, German production just gets overwhelmed by everybody else's. 
Yeah. And then yep. they start running out of men. Yep. And uh, that's pretty much it. And maintaining quality is, you know, <laughs> in, in the real world, yes, we may have the best tanks, but allegedly. But if you can't build enough for them, <laughs> well. What, what's really interesting here is, is that there's a, been a change in the view of uh, the Wehrmacht and, and its capability. There is a, a lot of people who have done a lot of really good research that, that we now understand that that whole view of the, the Wehrmacht at the start of the war as a mechanized army is completely false. The, right, there's an awful lot of Panzer IIs, threes running around before... Uh, there, there, there weren't even an awful lot of those. Like, if you look at the Polish campaign, they only had, you know, less than a thousand operational armoured vehicles. Well less. Um, all the newsreel footage focused on them, and so we have this warped perception of what they were, but they still had an army of, what was it, two million foot soldiers. So it was still primarily uh, an infantry-based um, manpower-heavy army. It's not mechanised at all. Um, it, it, it Wasn't that the issue with, with the initial... Um, Blitzkrieg though, yeah, they, it was actually too uh, successful, and they didn't have you know the ability for the army to follow up effectively, yeah. and and were lucky that that they achieved what they achieved. Yeah, absolutely, and and the poles, uh, the poles did a really really good job of holding them up. What did for them was the the um the Soviet pact. Because the Soviets opened the second front on Poland and Poland just collapsed because it couldn't fight two fronts at the same time. But they'd actually done a relatively good job of holding the German army up. And the reason France was so successful is because of the lessons that the Germans learnt in Poland because of the mistakes that had been made and the, the performance of the individual units and all that kind of stuff. It, it, you know, it was an army that was learning as it went. It... It, it really wasn't everybody talks about blitzkrieg too but that's how the german army operated and it operated like that for 50 years there's a word for it i can't recall it it's sitting in the edge of my brain um no can't recall it. It'll pop back in there at some point. But but this was their doctrine. Their doctrine was always: we're not going to fight a long war. We're going to fight a, a short, vicious war and and win quickly, like what they did to France at the end of the nineteenth century. That was ingrained in the the Prussian aristocracy and and military hierarchy: short, sharp, effective wars. Right, attrition wars suck. Yeah, attrition wars don't work. So shock and awe, <laughs> basically. But it's like so. Blitzkrieg nineteen forty was not a new concept at all. Not even close. But so uh, yeah, when they went into the Soviet Union, in, um. Barbarossa, three and a half million man army, and they had a thousand tanks. You tell me that's a mechanized army. It's not. Most of the infantry supply trains were horse drawn. <laughs> and as any player of war in Europe knows, you've got to build those uh, rail conversion units too. Oh, yeah. Because. Because why not have a seven-foot rail gauge? <laughs> why not? <laughs> I never played that game, Ross. That was one of those um, hexagon... SPI. SPI was, mega game. Mega game, yeah. yeah. Yep, mm -hmm. yep. No, we, we had the... At school, we had the space to put out all nine maps. Oh, and, nice. And play it. And we did so, you know, probably a couple times a year. Right. 
<laughs> and uh, in the you know, when I was a freshman, um, the uh, <laughs> the two upper class fanatics uh, would badge would call SPI, you know, asking for rules clarifications and what ifs. Um, based on the games that we were playing, because we had played it so many times, we probably played it through more times than anybody else around at the time. Right. I'm trying to think if we even finished it. We had it laid out on the, all the maps laid out on the, um, my friend's, one of my friend's brothers was overseas at the time, and he had his bedroom adjoined like the, the basement den of sorts. So we just took over that, that whole area for pretty much all of our games, and laid it all out. Yeah, but I I don't I can't recall finishing it. So, <laughs> but yeah, amazing game. Never played. No, it, Love those uh, SPI games. I I wrecked one of them because I kept rolling sixes for Allied reinforcements, which means it was a double reinforcement. So we ran out of stuff to bring <laughs> in, and it just <laughs> you know the German gave up in disgust because he just couldn't do anything. Yeah. Um. And, you know, you, you absolutely need a different mindset to play the Russians and uh, to be willing to uh, uh, <laughs> abandon whole scale sections of, uh, of the map to the uh, oncoming Germans, mm -hmm. knowing that winter is just around the corner. Yep. <laughs> winter is coming. Um. And then there's War and Flames from Australian Design Group, which World in Flames. We, we, we never ended up playing that. I think probably because we still had memories of the SPI one, Ross. But, uh, oh, it's, but, but then there's the, the Europa Lunatics, so... Yeah, it was uh, Europa oh. the we played. GDW, yeah. And we played Fire in the East and Scorched Earth. Those are the ones we played. And they were something else. We devoted a year to a game. Good times, good times. No, I think I have. Uh, I know I've got all of the core Europa boxes. Right. Um, but I've never, uh, I've never cracked them. It's a sad story, actually. That company. Good afternoon. Hey, Todd. Hey, hey Todd. Or good morning, depending on what part of the world you're in. Uh, yeah. So, oh, you mean uh, the, the collapse of GDW? Or yeah, oh, sorry. just the, just the fact that the, the current the current availability of the games is nil because the people that are running the company are, are all um, getting on in years and suffering health problems. Uh, you know, I looked at going and getting myself a copy of Fire in the East a couple of years ago, and it, it, it's just impossible to obtain at a price that's anything approaching sane. So let me just remind Todd of uh, capture and ransom rules for pilots. Yep. Oh, we had an idea. We need some. Oh, okay. It's part of the campaign rules. Yes. Now, is this part of the campaign campaign rules or the campaign rules in the core book? Campaign <laughs> campaign? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just making sure. Because that seems like it could get really complicated quickly. <laughs> Absolutely. Since we haven't talked about cash at all. There has to be at least three rolls on three different tables. <laughs> and you can ransom for space dollars <laughs> <laughs> the ubiquitous credit the ubiquitous yeah. credit the debit <laughs> we'll, we'll switch it up <laughs> that's my currency the debit I was going to put the word ether in there but <laughs> ether debit <laughs> the ether credit <laughs> just call it the ether and they leave it at that. <laughs> twenty-three ether. That'll cost you twenty-three ether. No, it costs you point two two three seven ether because, like Bitcoin, everything is in small fractions. In fractions. Yeah. No, Unless you're in the directorate, which is you know the 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 peak capitalist society. So they, they you know maybe you do work in debits there. 
you're paying off your life debt to the to the company. <laughs> Have you guys read a book called Diamond Age? Neil Stevenson? Heard of the author, but I have not read the book. So he did Snow Crash, but he also did one called Diamond Age. Diamond Age is really interesting because the the main protagonist, well, the main hero in the book's um, claim to fame was that he invented um, advertising, live advertising on disposable chopsticks. So you went, got noodles anywhere, you're chopsticks would recognize who you are and give you targeted advertising scrolling down them while you were eating your food <laughs> but they also had um active paper that you could fold and put in your pocket so that's where i was going with this was that what, what we need there is we need some of that active paper so that the table values can change constantly like bitcoin <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, oh, no. You know, this is goes into the uh, the the dream scheme, where we have uh, online resources that can replicate that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. You might need a few more did, programmers. Did we get the uh, the FASA coin right and go into go into our own crypto? <laughs> <laughs> Start selling non fungible tokens. What I just read something today about uh, coin or so, something based on where you basically bet on the outcome of court cases. <laughs> so that's that's what's that? That's that's cryptocurrency. So <laughs> betting <laughs> on who's going to prevail when Dan and I next play. Um, <laughs> Wouldn't that just be sports betting at this point? <laughs> <laughs> it's the same thing. Uh, bet whether a sportsman is going to be allowed into a particular country or not. <laughs> <laughs> and now the bet is hung up because of a uh, dispute. Yeah. So all the all the uh, big time bettors are uh, now trying to influence the outcome, right? Uh, like they wouldn't have been anyway. I shrug my shoulders. I'm waiting to be influenced for an outcome, right? Right. So, see, I think that's the thing. I think the big players don't wait. I think they influence the outcome before they even lay the bet. That's right. They, they arrange the current situation anyway so mm -hmm. they can get some more, uh, more people in on the action. Yes. This, people, is called the stock exchange. <laughs> Yes, I'm a cynic. No, it's okay. I balance that with my unbounded optimism. <laughs> <laughs> For those listening, Dan and I are uh, laughing hysterically at this at that last comment, right? I can't paint when you make me laugh like that. <laughs> Obviously, Todd, your definition, my definition of unbounded, uh, <laughs> uh, don't agree. <laughs> I'll be back on where you're at. Okay. And just see Maddie sitting there polishing his boot, shaking his head. Yeah. Uh, he dropped out on us. Ah, uh, did he? Yeah. Uh, he's had to go deal with his tradie. Something about them wanting to put air conditioning in the house. Don't need none of that here right now. Uh, certainly need it here. Any uh, update on your uh, 3D printing woes, or is it just too early in the game to uh, ask? I meant to call them before we had our call yesterday and then forgot and didn't do it, but the odds of them getting a delivery last week would have been small. pretty small anyway. Um, 
I, I think I'll continue that discussion with you after the live st stream because yep. I think we, we might have to go down a particular path. Oh, joy. Oh, joy. Speaking of ransom and credits. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a particularly expensive path to go down. <laughs> well, maybe I will tell the story. So, we're not sure, and by we, I mean the vendor and I, are not sure yet what the problem is. So, effectively, half the screen stopped working. So, um, this is the masking screen that masks the UV light from the resin okay got it right now those those screens they are uh, monochrome LCD screens they are considered consumables so after a certain period of time they fail uh, you get pixel dropout and those sorts of things so they're considered consumables so there's only a three month warranty on the consumables. So the machine's six months old. So the screen's out of warranty. The rest of the machine is in warranty. So the way the screen has failed is unusual and they're not sure whether or not it's the screen itself or the display adapter board that sits between the main oh. board and the screen. Now, in order to be able to test I have to have a fresh screen so I have to purchase <laughs> one because it's out of warranty now they don't have any stock of it there is stock on the way it's somewhere between the manufacturer and the warehouse somewhere we don't know where due to holiday postage and all that kind of stuff it could be closer to the factory than the warehouse we just don't know However, once they get it, it'll be four to five days to get it to me. Then it's got to go into the machine and we've got to test it. What the problem then is, is that it might be the adapter board. In which case, we have to submit a case to the printer manufacturer to get them to accept it as a warranty claim. Then they have to procure that part and send it to me. <laughs> oh, chaos. <laughs> well, it just means that because there are some other timing things going on, um, that we may actually stretch outside the boundaries of those other things. You know, the Rat King probably being foremost among them. Yeah, and that was... As soon as you said that to me last week, I went, uh oh I think we might be in trouble here. Anyhow. Yeah, we've got time on virtually everything else, but not but, him. But not that, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, we'll cover that ground again. <laughs> <laughs> yep. At the end of this, it it doesn't look good. Um, sad to say. Uh, what am I up to? Spears. Yeah, that'll do. That why we have no space guys to paint today. Um, well, that's not true. I've got some. Uh, just wanted to mix it up. <laughs> printed. Uh, yeah, I've been all over the shop as far as that stuff is concerned during the week. <laughs> Given how. far our um, live stream of the game last live stream of the game went I wondered if it was even worthwhile 
to be painting the miniatures. I don't know. <laughs> hey Ross, is Don okay? As far as I know. Okay. Seemed to be down He's yesterday. Trailed. Yeah, all right, okay. A lot going on. Oh yeah. He's going to be more frazzled now because I'm a day behind on the pilots. <laughs> I, I thought I would have more time to work on it today, and that did not materialize. You have a couple of meetings cancelled. Yeah, had a couple of meetings added. <laughs> Ugh, that should mean you should have got more done. I should have, but <laughs> I was actually the person needed in the meeting. <laughs> oh, but I should have to pay attention. I hate that. I know, it's the worst. And um, I like the big, the on. big company meetings, <laughs> the town halls. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Don has contributions to make in three lines, so it's uh, <laughs> it's a juggling act. He needs to clone himself somehow. We need a Don that's like a writer, and we'll work for free. Well, Don doesn't work for free. Yeah, that's no, remember, we, we need one work. that works for free. <laughs> we, we, we need one of him that works for free. Don's the only full-time employee, isn't he? He's not an employee. Oh, there you go. Can't, Contract. Don't, ever say, don't ever say that. No. Subcontract? He's a... Uh, yeah, essentially the same as a freelancer as everybody else. Right, okay. I missed the company meeting this week due to technical difficulties, i.e. I wasn't reminded. But not by you guys. <laughs> I had a I had a reminder set up and I got it, just not on the device I expected to get it on. Hey, I sent it out an email earlier in the day uh, yeah. while you I, were sleeping. Uh -huh. I got that too, yesterday. I like, <laughs> oh yeah, I should probably check my faster emails. Oh, bugger. No, it's... 99% uh, of those emails come from Kickstarter. You know, this year should be... Uh, very, very interesting in terms of uh, product releases all across the company. Mm hmm And uh, I don't know if you guys saw today or yesterday, I think it came out, the... Uh, da, 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 where is it? Gen Con actually released their schedule of milestone events um, of particular interest I can find the we need to start planning our uh, events uh, that goes without saying um, when is the uh, event registration deadline or event submission that I is not clear but they will start accepting them. Um, immediately, I think. I think today was, or yesterday was the day that uh, event submission opened. Well, again, I haven't gone in in a while. Um, that's last year. Where's the new one? But uh, housing, I think, opens in mid-February. Um, badge purchasing opens imminently um, you will be required to show proof of vaccination what they call full course treatment I assume that out will mean initial shots and recommended boosters uh, as well as wearing masks inside throughout sounds like a hassle but I get it They're obviously not bothered by the current rates. I think they're hoping, planning on uh, 
you know, the current uh, conflagration to uh, be gone, and hopefully whatever comes next is either done with or is uh, won't affect what their decision making is. Yeah. Um, yeah, all of this is predicated on nothing extraordinary happening. Well, it sounds to me like that April 1 date you gave me is actually more like March 1. Uh, yes and no. I mean, the the one thing that this email didn't say where I just wish I could find it oh, there we go so badge registration opens on the 30th of January uh, hotel registration February 13th uh, event registration opens May 15th So they've published their timetable. So what does event encompass? Um, anything that you want to be able to offer to uh, an attendee from an hour of talking about how to be a freelance artist to a four hour game session to anything beyond and in between. Okay, so what about ad hoc demonstration games? We provide a schedule of however, whether it's a one hour block, two hour block, right, or okay. more, our decision, and say, you know, designed for four, six, however many people. Okay. And whoever shows up, shows up. Right. So it's not ad hoc at all, it's reserved it's time. But in Gen Con, you have people who really know what they want to do and will have their schedule mapped out to the minute and have their tickets purchased accordingly. Mm -hmm. And then you have the people who will just buy generic tickets and wander by and look at what's interesting to them and see if there's a slot open at that particular time. Right, okay. So, Todd, our events were, our miniature demo games were two hours? Usually, they they usually were, yeah. Um, for four to six players, yeah. And, uh, and usually, we would get over half of them. At least somebody would show up to to play the game, whether it was eighteen seventy nine or Demon World or Noble Armada. Right. Yep. Yeah. Now, Noble Armada would run for four hours because it's a little more involved and Dan has asked the question about the standing demon world armies for demo purposes Do we have um, a we'll, list? you will have to have Kyle go down into his basement of all the stuff I uh, put in there and <laughs> open the boxes so there is an assortment Dan but Neither, yeah. None of us at the moment can say exactly what it is. Okay, so you know, I don't know. I don't know how they feel about the Omicron, but I can talk to Kyle and see if I can go over there and make a list. Yeah. Um, can we stock take it thoroughly with not only list but photos? Uh, maybe. Maybe. Depends on the lighting in his basement, <laughs> which is more of a crawl space. <laughs> Hmm. But I will I will uh, talk to Kyle and see if we can hook something like that up. Be because the alternative is, is that I prepare them here and bring them with me. That's not as convenient. Although, the, yours would be better painted. Well, no, actually not. Half of yours would be better painted. We had half of them painted by somebody really good and the other half I painted. And they are horrible. <laughs> There's that optimism. Oh, I, I know my skills as a painter. <laughs> it, it was a very positive statement, Ross. <laughs> are they mixed in, or are they separate armies that are of that quality? Uh, uh, units, right? Yeah. 
but I'm, I'm, it's guaranteed, Dan, that you're not going to see the assortment that you would really like to have. Right, okay. Okay. <laughs> but we will we will try to inventory them. I'll, I'll try to get together with Kyle on that in the next yeah. month. So, on your notepad of Doom, Ross, can you add an entry for <laughs> a conversation about um, what we want to do to sort out the mix of units that we want to see for those demos? Yeah, no, that's part of the later today's conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And my recommendation is if you're going to run a demo for newbies, you know, two or three units per person seems to be about the limit of what they can handle. Yeah. You know, unless they're very familiar with the system. Well, nobody will be very familiar with the system. Yeah. Uh, some you know, but but there's people that catch on a little quicker than others sometimes. But it depends on you know who you get at the table. Mm -hmm. Like if you're getting um, brand new gamers, you know, you know, you give them two or three units and and they're they're happy for two hours. <laughs> Unless their dad across the table from them, you know, wipes them out, you know, spitefully in the first round. <laughs> which, which happens regularly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm afraid I was and, one of I those fathers. But I have to admit that I too am a of a of a am a of the uh, give no quarter faction when playing with uh... <laughs> children, offspring. Yep. Yes, I remember taking my daughter to cricket clinic, and they had her bowl to me, and I was the first parent that put a ball out of the park. <laughs> She ran the entire length length of the pitch to punch me in the arm. It was great. <laughs> and after that, it was on for young and old. Every father didn't hold back at that point. <laughs> It'd been very sedate up to then. I was like, "Oh, you can do this and get away with it." <laughs> I oh. can take a punch in the arm. Yeah. The Who knows what's going to come after <laughs> later in the evening? Yeah. But. <laughs> uh, the instructors were sitting there rolling their eyes, which was good. But I would, uh, uh, our issue is going to be manpower, as it always is, to run games. Yeah. Because I would really like to see, in addition to a, as many two-hour sessions, introductory sessions, for at least once per game line, to do at least a four-hour to flex the, uh, you know, to show what a good battle looks like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. So, okay. So event submission, event submission opened, opens on Sunday, and runs through March thirteenth. So, how many days is it? Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So it's a four day, and is there a setup day and a takedown day? There's a setup day and. Um, that's mainly for, uh, you know, exhibitors and that sort of thing. And we will, you know, we can disassemble the booth in, uh, in a couple of hours. Right. It may take, you know, six to six plus to put it up, but taking it down is really fast. Okay. So, you know, it's, the whole thing's done and dusted by Sunday evening, but you're using Wednesday to set up. Yep. I do. And that's early events mission, January 9th through February 13th. So if we can get organized enough to take advantage of that, that might be a good idea because read, reading last year, they did limit the amount of events. So. So. That's a no, that's a date I didn't know before February thirteenth. Absolutely, we need to get our majority of our things in, vast yeah. majority of our things in by then. Yeah. So, yeah. okay, bear with me, being the alien. Is it still on Lake Geneva, or is it moved? It's in Indianapolis. <laughs> Remember, it's a facility that can handle seventy-five thousand people. Okay. Um, so they will probably let in significantly less than that this year. Okay. Um, yeah. So there's as much space as you can dream of having to run an event. 
No, my point is, where is it in the country? Indianapolis, oh, Indianapolis. Indiana. So it's in, in Indiana, which is more east than west, right? Yeah. Practically, yes. <laughs> so you're, you're not going to get a direct flight from there? Oh, uh, no. You land probably on the west coast? I'll and have then to go into L.A. Uh, from there, you're probably taking one or two, probably two more flights to get to Indianapolis. Maybe Chicago to Indy or Fort Worth. That, you know, it depends on your airline then. Yeah. Oh, that'll be good fun. That'll be a full 24 hours traveling. Um, yeah. Uh, and, thus, and that's something that we can talk about uh, after. Mm-hmm. Because you, um, if you're going to come all this way, um, I would hope that you could take advantage of uh, other invitations, shall we say. Yeah, I don't really want to travel... 48 hours to spend four days on the ground that's mean <laughs> yep yep uh, last time i was in the u.s i worked in palo alto for four weeks based out of mountain view so i don't know that i can afford four weeks but it's got to be longer than four days so yeah, let's talk about that too. Todd, do you think we have any? Uh, is our previous crop of uh, demo, you know, demo runners exhausted at this point? Yeah, I would say we we need to find new people, if okay. possible. I, w I would not count on our previous demo runners. They since they failed us last. Uh, Gen Con. Um, that's that we were the reason at. for the question, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I want... Uh, is it possible to get uh, addresses and t-shirt sizes from you guys? Yes. Right. Sort of. Sort yeah, of. I was going to say, Todd, Todd, where are you going to be at that point? Um, I will probably be in Oregon for Gen Con time. Okay. You're going to park in Ross's driveway? Uh, no, we'll be <laughs> at the southern part of the state. But but that raises interesting possibilities either before or after. Mm. Yeah. I gotta make um, some phone calls next week, but I plan on being there June, July, and through August. So and okay, try it, to get out of there before it snows. If you're in Oregon in August, you'll be flying to Indianapolis. Uh, probably. Yeah. It's a long drive. It's it's probably forty plus hours from mm -hmm. West Coast to Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. A long way. Okay. Yeah, let's how wide is Australia? Uh, 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 continental Australia is virtually the same size as um, continental US. Continental US, yeah. So without Alaska, yep, it's about the same size. Um, you could probably transpose the two. So. A lot less roads through the middle, though. Uh, yeah. It's a big, empty place. How many have we got now, Matty? 26 million? Something along those? 27 million? Yeah, roughly. Yeah. Versus the US has got 320 or 330. Yep, yep. Yeah. Yes, especially since we, I, hmm, that's the, that's the, no, I'm just thinking about uh, game lines that we want to offer demos for, and we have to decide what to do about Noble Armada. Well, 
<laughs> was that was that was that a clang I heard? Is it landed on the floor? Uh, exactly. That's a tough one. Yeah, especially to... since we might be have a have just done a Kickstarter for it. Hmm. Yeah, that makes it a much more difficult conversation, doesn't it? Yep. Yeah, yes and no. I mean, the Kickstarter's really going to sell miniatures, not rules. Uh, but I'm going to offer the rule book as part of packages. Oh, sure. Hopefully in but conjunction it, with uh, something the Ulysses folks are going to do. In the um, years since we've published the rule set I've had one question on it so <laughs> I, I know there's tons of people out there playing it there's that optimism again unbridled well what gets me is every time I run it people enjoy it they go buy it <laughs> exactly the case I mean that's if you know I've always said and it's been true from the very beginning um, if you can get somebody to sit down at the table with you you can convince them to buy the game mm -hmm. the problem being that person's got to take it home and then convince someone else to sit down with them back in the good old days that's how it worked you know what we ca we called anybody who attended a convention like Gen Con you know the the alpha players they were the guys who were sent out who went out to find out what was new and interesting and they brought it home and it spread from them through the local GameStop gaming groups whatever that's how the word of mouth worked well, I'm not denying it it's just so many games out there vying for attention at the moment and uh, well yeah everything else yep no, no question. It's never been a better time to be a gamer of any description, role-playing, PC, you know, electronic or tabletop. It's never been a better time. The variety is astonishing. But it, it's, that because of that variety, Maddie's point is even more valid. Oh, yeah. It's trying to find a group to game with when you've gone off and gotten the game that you love and trying to convince somebody else to uh, give it a shot. I don't need to lift my eyes too far from this painting table to see dozens upon dozens of gaming systems that fall into exactly that category. It's like the only person in my gaming group that has the game is me. Sad but yeah. true. Sad but true. Yeah, I don't know. We'll have to think about that, but we'll have to take that conversation offline, I think. And Yep. It's not much of a stretch, Ross, to say that I've played more games against you in the last couple of months than I have against my regular gamers in the last four years. Uh, That's I, you don't even want to know how many years it goes back for... Uh, uh -huh for me it's just a sad indictment and uh, my level of commitment to getting out to gaming groups I think if you want to talk miniatures games the only one I've played with anybody is with the one time we did it Dan online mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I can't convince anybody in the group to play a game so miniatures wise okay but you've done Noble Armada demos at Gen Con so yes yeah but those that does that For count? For whatever reason, those don't count. Right, nope. okay. Yeah, you know, you'd think your friends would at least want to help you with stuff. <laughs> well, it, it, you said something to me 12 months ago, which uh, is is really, really, really astute. And that is, is that you get people and, and you talk to them about what you're doing and they get interested in what you're doing and they decide that they want to get involved, and then they realize they have to do some work. 
<laughs> and all of a sudden, the interest dries up very quickly. Strange that, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but even like if it's like, hey, come over on a Sunday, help me roll, you know, play test this. You know, you mm-hmm. get to blow up some fighters. Nah. <laughs> no. Yeah, I'd the same. You know, it's like, all right, thanks, thanks. I'm, I'm glad we're, we're friends. <laughs> well, so I'm not going to force anybody to do anything if they don't want to do it. They don't want to do it. So no, exactly. The sad fact of that is, is I'm so busy at the moment that if they're not helping me and they're not involved, <laughs> there isn't a lot of attention being paid. It's like, oh, you want to do that? No, sorry, I've got other more important things to do. And I'm sure the same goes in the other direction. I always had a mind retirement homes, you know, trying to find a a retirement home in a nice area with with like-minded friends and you know sitting down and playing the games that we genuinely wanted to play but for whatever reason real life got in the way and we just didn't have time of course the dice all had to be bigger so you can see the pips on them but well, you and the rules you aren't playing europe at war then probably a good time to well, I mean, you'd have the time, but you would need magnifying glasses. Tweezers and, and counters and uh, magnifying True. glasses, yes. That's what the retirement home staff for, basically moving the counters for you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, son, do you mind just moving that stack of cardboard? Just, uh, that's the perfect, thank you. <laughs> oh, by the way, remind me what the numbers are on each one of those chits. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> And so, now add them up for me. Yeah, right. That's like, and and we're attacking Leningrad. I don't care. Don't tell me the odds. We're attacking Leningrad. <laughs> Where's that again? <laughs> I spoke with a recruiter the other week who had no idea where Australia was, let alone New Zealand. Well, there you go. I not, shouldn't be surprised. Not sure Maddie and I have any idea either, do we? Uh, it's down there somewhere. It's it's where the tennis players down under. are not. It's down under. I could tell you all about Rand McNally, but uh, yeah. yeah. Of encyclopedia really... fame? <laughs> no, 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 it's it's the place where people wear hats on their feet and hamburgers eat people. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, without going into a rant, it seems like uh, history and geography take a uh, back seat in education anymore. Uh, in basic math. I thought, and and this may yeah, just be an outsider's warped perspective, but I thought the the general American education was focused on America. So people had good appreciation of American history and American geography and all that kind of stuff, but not so much of the rest of the world is that a bias that's the ideal right yeah i think some of it depends on the the region of the u.s you're in but i think that holds pretty true no matter where you are but i think every generation from the beginning has always said that the the younger generation didn't have to do as much didn't have to be as rigorous in their studies as uh as it was when we had to do it. Uh, you know, I hear that, and I hear people talking about, you know, oh, our, our generation was tougher because we had to do this and that and the other and all that kind of stuff, and the younger generation, they're soft and all this kind of stuff. I, don't, I, I just don't agree. I think every generation finds it as difficult as the generation before. They've just got different problems to solve. Yeah. Yeah, like 18-year-olds in 1944. <laughs> Mm. They're certainly learning different things. Yeah. I couldn't imagine having to navigate high school and social media. No, like, what a, it's got to be horrible. What a nightmare. Like, high school was bad enough as it was. And you could yeah. get away from people. Now you can't get yeah. away from them. Nobody re- could record the dumb stuff I did. <laughs> I was bullied at school. I just can't imagine if they bullied it con- bullying it continued into the evenings. Yeah, yeah, at home and well, you know, no, no matter that. 
you would have been bullied and the others would have been standing around videoing it and then putting it up online. Yeah, that's right. It's a whole different thing. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, I, I tend to have less sympathy for people that are saying, oh, you know, the, the younger generation have got it easy. No, they've just got it different. Just, just different, yeah. And I Except actually thought Maddie, Maddie our generation... <laughs> I think my generation had it pretty easy, so I can't really... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we only had to go through the 80s to it. It's fine. Yeah. The 80s weren't bad here. I mean, for me anyways, you know, uh, being you know, solidly middle class. Yeah, that's true too. I was talking about music videos, but never mind. We can just oh, move yeah. on. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that's a whole other nightmare, but you know... <laughs> That explains why we sit down in our, you know, workshops uh, painting, you know, tiny miniatures. <laughs> well, I'm not sure there is an explanation for that. We chose wisely. Yes. That's an Indiana Jones quote. So do I not need my current generation of Demon World and 1879 Miniatures Rules books? <laughs> Wait until Dan and I have a conversation this afternoon. Yeah. Okay. Because I, I, can, I can stand to downsize a little bit more, so... <laughs> I don't think any of us would survive what you've put yourself through, Todd. <laughs> Yeah. That's, it's a brave choice you've made. There's no question about that. Well, we'll, we'll see what adjective we use in about three months. <laughs> <laughs> Have you taken possession of the uh, the new home yet? Yep. Does it have a name? Okay. Giant Motorhome. <laughs> That's its name. Got to give it a name. GMH. Goom. But, um, yeah, we got possession. I took out the love seat. I, I started putting a desk in, and then uh, the weather has taken a turn for the bitter cold. So that, that progress is halted for the moment. Do I dare ask what a love seat is? It's a tiny couch. Well, it's a couch for two people. It probably has Cozy a different couch. name in Australia. Two-seater. Right. But here we have like it's regular couches. Just a couch. Yeah. So yeah. Well, regular couch seats three. Yes, or more. Or more. Whereas a love seat is designed for two people. Two normal sized people. Well. Mm -hmm. Depends on where you buy it from. Two normal sized people or two Americans. Well, you know. I think the the world is catching up with us, Todd, in that respect. Yeah, I agree. We went to the movies a couple of times over the last couple of weeks, and I'm looking at the average cinema seat and thinking that it's probably not big enough anymore. Not necessarily for myself, but for the majority of the patrons that were in that cinema, that was true. Given yeah, my last three months, that's becoming true again for me, so... Mm. <laughs> After working so hard, Todd... Yeah, well, yeah, unfortunately, I work so hard in a chair. <laughs> yeah, well. Well, this is the thing. You exercise your brain all day and you don't exercise your body all day. You get to the end of the day, you're mentally tired, but physically, your body's just been storing all of that sugar you've been shoveling into it. And it's well, Todd, you're going to come down here and help me with the livestock. I was gone because I had to go down downfield and change the water for the sheep and feed the pigs and give them water and check the other sheep to make sure we didn't have more lambs and you know there once it's warm <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah okay there is that fair <laughs> so <laughs> so the pigs are still not the, in their final not resting food, place yeah. Yeah, right. no we were still waiting um, everything is a complete disaster because our um, our local butcher uh Got, I think I mentioned it in a yeah, previous, yeah, yeah, in a previous yeah. episode, a couple of weeks previously ago. on <laughs> previously Jack and Payne's on, Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yeah. He got knocked on, and so he's had to 
build a USDA approved facility and all that kind of stuff, which is ridiculous because it, it, it's not butchering for other people. It's butchering for us. So, you know, um, anyway, it is, it is what it is. So we've got to, we've got to hang on to them for a little longer, We're hoping he'll be done by the end of the month. So, hmm. January being the month, <laughs> but we shall see. So it's going to be a horrible January. <laughs> actually, Feb, Feb's going to be worse because I think we've actually got a relatively mild January here in Ohio if the weather holds, and you know how that works out. Um, but yeah. February's looking pretty bad. So, <laughs> what was negative eight when I woke up here today? Oof, feels like all the actual temp. That's the actual temp. Uh, oh, that's really. negative eight Fahrenheit. I don't know what is that is in crazy Australian numbers. They. When, where are they equal? Well, we, Maddie, is it minus thirty? I'm not sure. You got. I you gotta think divide it by nine. That way, yeah. Yeah, divide by nine and subtract thirty or something. Zero yeah. zero degrees is negative seventeen Celsius. That's how it works out. Yeah, I think they 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 do cross, <clears throat> uh, but I yeah, think the it's Google a, machine tells me that's minus twenty two Celsius. Right there, you go. That's cold, mind you. No, it gets it gets even colder. <laughs> my 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 Russian Russian that's, friend. That's why we left Chicago. Yeah. That's why we are leaving. <laughs> the lake effect. Lake Michigan. What are you? Yeah, I think you are, aren't you? Lake Michigan. Yeah. Lake Michigan. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But that actually helps us. Uh, it's it's the the. Canadian Arctic uh, dips in the jet stream that that are the ones that bring in the cold air. And Ohio being slightly farther south, I think you guys miss out on some of those. Parts of Ohio. The, if you go to north of Ohio, you don't because you're closer to the lake. So, yeah. you know, you're, yeah. you're right. Now that side of the lake, I think, I think they get screwed. This side of the lake, usually we get the, the advantage. We get strange weather where we are, and we did when we were living in Westchester and since Cincinnati. It was it's just because of the the way that the the hills basically formed a pattern, kind of. You know, the, so you get extreme weather events, but they kind of break up a little on, on the hills. So we're in this weird bowl where you'd still get the weather, you know, the horrible weather, but it wasn't as horrible as if you went, you know, a couple of miles away away from home. And here we're in a similar th in a similar thing. You know, we're just kind of on the cusp. Um, I don't know why, but this is what it is. But. I'm a little bit baffled. So there are areas in the US that in winter, they they get ridiculous amounts of cold and snow and all that kind of stuff, and then in spring they get tornadoes. Yep. Yes. Yes. That sounds like a place that you don't want to be. It's a northern hemisphere generally. A place you don't want to be. You're there by well, choice, subject. James. <laughs> oh, yeah, but the people here are fantastic, so you know. <laughs> that's that's why Todd's doing what he's doing, so he can move to where it's better. And there is always, depending on seasons, that place is different. Yep. I can just see him. So Todd has a map on his, on his trailer of all the states, and then they correspond with the database of seasons, you know, and it's got like... <laughs> Nice to extreme weather events, so then he just kind of picks and chooses depending on where he is in the air. I'm sorry, I can just see Todd as Bill Paxson in Twister driving that motorhome yep. down the road chasing the tornado going, it's a class five. Going, Bugger, I stayed in Florida for too long. <laughs> I would be the one to do that. My wife, on the other hand, <laughs> might have... <laughs> <laughs> uh, she may differ on that. What's the definition of staying in Florida too long? Is that at all? Hurricane season. All right. <laughs> Basically no, January through December. <laughs> right. You know, I saw a weather map last week that showed the whole continental U.S. in blue, meaning very cold, mm. except for Florida. Right. So. It's all the old people generating all that methane, so it kind of warms <laughs> the place up. <laughs> I thought all the old people died off. Nope, they're still there. 
You see, Florida is the one place in America I'd want to live. Yeah, but you're a Queenslander. Because it's warm. You weirdo. <laughs> Hurricanes aren't uh, so bad. It's warm and yeah. wet. Why? It gets real hot, like Pen Pensacola, where I was for six months in the height of summer. Um, not on the coast, to be fair, it was a little inland. Um, you know, that was, uh, it's probably Australian temps, you know, it was up around 40 degrees Celsius without, you know, anything added to that. Um, plus the plus 100% of humidity too, yeah. right? Oh, um, and that as well. And the rain, oof, it, it, it buckets. And, you know, we had um, a trip Dawn and I were doing and uh, we were driving down the road there was a car overtook us and we carried on and, and the driving rain driving very carefully in the driving rain and then we came around around the bend and they had gone off the corner <laughs> into the, into the ditch they just couldn't see you know stopped made sure they were okay and everything but but the, it, just the rain was just so torrential um and that that just happens out of nowhere it's quite quite insane but different parts of florida are different so we get that kind of rain in melbourne james like we just had Where's, a, uh, Melbourne. Where's that again? <laughs> Isn't that somewhere in the Ukraine? Uh, yep, that's it. No, now there is a Melbourne, Florida. There is probably. <laughs> there is. No, probably no, there a Vegemite is. sandwiches too. <laughs> <laughs> What's the rule about circular conversations a across live stream boundaries, <laughs> Maddie? <laughs> Uh, we're getting into Venn diagrams. <laughs> right. <laughs> the intersection of this thought train with this thought train equals these thought trains. Yeah, I, uh, I'm afraid I can't do 40 degrees in humidity. I just cannot. It isn't, it isn't as bad as all that. Um, it, it, and the, the people actually are, well, I, I can't attest to the rest of Florida, to be honest just from Pensacola experience, but the Pensacola people are, are great. They're really friendly. Mm, Northern very, very Florida is pretty nice. The Panhandle, yep. Smaller pop population as well, so. Yeah, I'll admit, I, I've never had, like, run into anybody, like, in pretty much any, I mean, I've run into rude people in every state I've been to, but for the most part, I think people are just people. Yep. Yep, very much. You get that everywhere. Yeah, I mean, there's rude people uh, everywhere. I mean, you can go to the friendly except Melbourne. Yeah. Oh no, yeah. oh, <laughs> Melbourne. Melbourne's no, no. the friendliest city on earth, isn't it? Uh, no, I think the hasn't been for the last couple of years. Fifty percent of the people down here have changed their name to Karen. Ah, <laughs> uh. it's actually Karen. It's actually um, somewhat uncomfortable place to be at the moment. That seems to be like a global problem too, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot more, and I think again, when we come back to the social media thing, I think a lot of people know they're being filmed, and and that amps up the, you know, emotions and. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, once a camera is pointed at them, you know they're they're gonna have a reaction. You know that. So I don't know. It's an adjustment. We play with forces humanity was not yet ready for. <laughs> Existence. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> so who's going to watch the Moonfall movie, the new post apoc style movie coming out from, um, uh, what's his name, the guy, the king of disaster movies, you know, the one who did the, the free Michael after Bay? After tomorrow. No, Emmerich, oh. Roland Emmerich. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, Having premises, the moon is basically crashing into the earth. And yeah, because so the sense it, of wants up to deal to it. Be, be, because it's a, a an extraterrestrial construct. So you've seen the trailer, okay? Yes, I went and saw Dune. Part one. Part one. So I went and saw D. <laughs> with the N to follow. We did start watching Foundation on Apple I'm sorry. TV Plus. I could save you some time <laughs> and say <so you> don't. <laughs> really? Uh, I actually I actually thought the first episode at least was actually not bad. But uh, I turned it off halfway it. 
through the first episode. <laughs> Apparently, it gets very different after the first two episodes. I haven't Red watched it. Book. It's on my to watch list. Yeah, I'm actually okay with that as long as it's not, you know, stupid like other shows. I mean, and uh, this stuff is all, there's always sorry. a personal appearance. All right, okay. Oh well, I'll, I'll watch a couple more, and if it's if it's too too far off the mark, then I'll I'll cancel my free trial. It's all good. Yeah, I, I had to quit after like halfway through the first episode. I'm like, nah, nah, this ain't doing it. <laughs> Did you go? Whereas the Expanse, oh. Oof. Did you guys uh, try Wheel of Time yet? Yes. Um, same thing as Foundation, apparently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> From other people's opinions of Foundation. No, no, I didn't have the highest opinion of the books, so the show was just middle of the road. Right. Did I as well. I made it through episode three, which is actually the number of books that I made it through in the, in the series. And that's only because I took them with me on my honeymoon. Only those books to force me to read them. So, um, yeah, but the, the, the TV series could have been great. Um, but anyway, it is what it is. There was a lot of potential in it. And I think, I don't, I don't know why, but they, they missed the mark just slightly. These are all opinions, listeners, if, if anyone's yeah, been watching. It's, it's, if oh, you yeah, enjoy yeah. it, I mean, absolutely. Yeah. Go wild. Oh, if you enjoyed it, that's awesome. <laughs> it's, I'm just speaking for me. Um, <laughs> which is season two? Two episodes into that, enjoying it. Um, the Witch is the Witcher. Watched the first episode, liked it. I just haven't had time to get to any more yet. So I do recommend watching the um, the animated movie. However, that's on Flix. It's a nice oh. little pre pre prequel to some of the stuff in season two. Cool. Uh, what's it called? The Hour of the Wolf or something? Yeah. There's some nice little Easter eggs. So. I I got most of the way through season two and forgot it was Henry Cavill so oh yeah so I right. think I think it's That's that good. good yeah I think it's that good he's excellent he can do no wrong at the moment so that's well, what it is he plays Warhammer so you know the guy's mm -hmm. not <laughs> he's not perfect <laughs> did you see the there's an opportunity there did you did you see the the ribbing that he got from um, Graham Norton about that. Um, I um, don't Look, think I saw. Was this a recent Graham Norton? Yeah. Episode? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, no, I, I, I catch those very irregularly. Graham Norton, for anyone who's not familiar with Graham Norton, is everyone here familiar with Graham Norton? But for oh, yeah. Yeah, yep. Graham Norton is just a great, great show. But he, he is who he is doesn't pretend yes. to be anything else and gets the best out of his guests as a result and, and uh -huh. they basically respond in kind so it's good i think he's the so he so got a he got got a ribbing about his nerdy um yeah about hobbies about, <laughs> about which was really funny because the guy that's playing the current spider-man was on the couch well, you know halfway across the studio because of covid but um he, he was sort of jumping up and down in the air going i'll come over and play so, nice. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> Did we all watch the uh, Potter 20th anniversary thing? Not. Not? Negative. Nope. Ross? Nope. Nope. There you go. No Harry Potter fans here. Moving on. I'm a fan. I just... just I don't know retrospectives and review or you know whatever that kind of stuff doesn't take up much let's have another much book time. yeah <laughs> let's have another book dear joe <laughs> well we do another movie at some point No, we're very much on a Lord of the Rings kick at the moment, so... Are you? Oh, yes. You're looking forward to that um, sort of uh, Elder no, Days not. prequel thingy? No? I am so not. What's this now? Uh, the doing, uh, Am Amazon, Amazon bought the rights to uh, make oh, Lord yeah, of the Rings. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Television, it oh. out. 
It's the second age, isn't it? Second age, yep. I, w I was uh, more excited for it before I watched Game of Thrones, or not Game of Thrones, uh, Wheel of Time. Yep. Right. After Wheel of Same Time, I'm well. less excited for their Lord of the Rings stuff. <laughs> the first season's um, filmed in New Zealand. They did all the filming down there, then I think they've, they've moved out from New Zealand and gone somewhere else. I'm not, not sure where they ended up. But, um... the, the problem that I have with the fall of Numenor is, is that it falls into that one bad guy trope thing again. Everybody else is good, but they're corrupted by the one bad guy. It just gets a little bit old. Well, yeah, I guess. But then again, he kind of did it largely before <laughs> everybody else. So, not everybody else, but well, this is the before thing it was. Uh, c certainly, it's the foundational work for fantasy, for modern fantasy. But Tolkien himself admitted quite openly that he ripped most of his ideas off from other things that he'd seen absolutely yep inspiration kind of like the history of writing right or you know it, it is fiction you know he, it was his attempt to put together a cohesive sort of history of fairy tales almost i mean that's like every game setting that exists that would not exist without oh. all the things that came before him <laughs> Yep. Well, there's plenty of stuff out there that definitely precedes it. You go back to Dun Dunsany. Um, I mean, has anyone here read The Worm or Oberos? That's a great, great, great book. I don't think I could Hard even to say read. that. E.R. Edison is the author for that. And yeah. it's, it's full of goblins and politics and battles and heroes dying all over the place. It's it's really, really kind of heroically bleak, I guess. But... um. But it, it, it came out, you know, well out before Lord of the Rings. So. Mm -hmm. Lovecraft. Egg Rice Burrows, blah, 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 you know. Mm -hmm. If you've not heard of it, I actually recommend reading it. That was one of the ones that I didn't read until probably I was 15, maybe. Now, Spencer's the Fairy Queen. That is hard reading. <laughs> That's all I'm saying on that one. Okay. And it's not finished. <laughs> and it's never going to be. So, If you like ye olde English, that's, that's, that's up there. Okay, so how many of you guys have read Ian Banks? Um, I've read a couple of Ian Banks books. Um, 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 i trying to think. The, the, he did some like... Um, not as a science fiction series. The um, he, did, he did some other stuff. It's kind of like alternate history. Trying yeah, to think what it was, but the no. Wasp, the Wasp Factory, Canal Dreams, Crow Road. Sounds like it. Yep. Yep. Right. Quite a while back though. Uh, he's dead. So yes. Right. And unfortunately, got a very nasty rare form of cancer and uh, passed away a few years ago, uh, which is an incredible loss to to the the science fiction literary world. However, he did a book called Fearsome Engine. I have heard of the title, but have not read it. Right. So one of the characters' perspectives in Fearsome Engine is written from... Uh, it is written in phonetic Scottish. So it's written the way that a Scot would pronounce the words with a, a broad Scottish accent. Seriously? Yeah. Ouch. Yeah. It's unbelievably hard to read. <laughs> You were going to say something, Ross? No. Okay. It's a good book. It's hard to read. You read Perdido Street Station and the other ones in the same uh, universe? China Meville? China Melville? No. M I E V I L L E. No. You'd probably enjoy those if you like Ian Banks. Hmm. 
I, I the one thing about Ian Banks that um, really struck me very early on when I was reading, because the first book of his I read was Consider for Bass, um, was his grasp of scale and his ability to portray scale. Um, there's a there's a flight sequence in Consider Flabass where they're flying through the interior of a spaceship and he describes how big the interior is and it's just like wow that is jaw dropping like it takes the sort of the, the majesty and scale of Star Wars and just blows it out again you know starships that are 80 kilometers long 20 kilometers wide and 10 kilometers deep it, it just mind-blowing it's fantastic stuff and yeah, it, i haven't you know, read it it's on my list but i've been trying not to read too many things science fictiony so as to avoid unconsciously borrowing them <laughs> yeah it it's yeah the culture so who are your top three great. authors if you had to choose three authors, just out of curiosity, I already know mine, but yeah, Tolkien, Martin, and Banks. So you're a Martin fan, Game of Thrones, or yeah. some of his other stuff? No, primarily Game of Thrones. It's I'm a bit of a fan of the Wars of the Roses, so it it just resonated with me. I thought it was. Uh, I I thought it was absolutely brilliant fiction back in 2001. Um, long before it anywhere near went near television or anything like that. I th just thought the the world was rich and deep. The characters were uh, rounded and nuanced, and the the plot lines and and all that kind of stuff were deep and intricate. And the the writing was compelling. You had you know characters that you were upset at him killing off so have you read his novel fever dream no it's set in the mississippi river no. it's very and and rice-ish but I, I think better but that's my opinion so wow. that, that wouldn't be difficult i did the Anne rice thing hmm. i was left Didn't disappointed we yeah i was just Both disappointed by the end of it <laughs> mine is jack jack vance yeah by none and uh david gemmel would be my second and Tolkien would be my third yeah yeah I, I Mans, because of his mastery of language he's just yeah. th there's no one else like him um period I, I tend Gimel to all because he's just great I, I tend to set Tolkien aside I, I tend to not because it's because it's the original if you like it's very difficult to compare um because all the derivative works are necessarily uh, derivative and some of them are better in some aspects because they've learnt the lessons of the Lord of the Rings so I actually prefer a Silmarillion but that's mm -hmm. that's just me um, mm -hmm. but Lord of the Rings is an excellent set of novels don't get me wrong but um the um, first age, first age stuff is just so much grander in scope. So, and and super 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 clever. Well, and it, it's it it has those those uh, throwbacks to you know to the ancient you know Scandinavian tales and mm -hmm. and stuff. It it has that that heroic feel. This is where the Wimmer Rob Ross I mentioned earlier is is kind of big as well. Yep. Things are bigger. Um, you don't you don't get bogged down in the detail. And you can fill the rest in with your own imagination, which is just always much more satisfying. Yeah. But. Yeah. Gemmel just makes me cry. So I read his books and, and I'm always, 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 without fail. It's just, it is what it is. So, mm. so any, any author that grabs you by the heartstrings and just without fail yanks them as a, as a winner. Yeah. And there's no other author that I've found that does that. So that that's a personal thing, obviously. But mm. and he's a great writer. So he was a great writer, unfortunately died too young as well. So mm. Yeah. All right, everybody, I gotta jump out of here. So have a great uh, yeah, evening and weekend and day and yeah, it's five o'clock.
It is. Have fun Thanks, working Tony. on those uh, collision rolls, uh, Todd. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Have a good one. Uh, thanks, everybody else. It's been a very engaging discussion. Um, another classic. So, uh, see you all next week. Cheers. Kia ora. <laughs> Later. <laughs>